So I'm, I'm really excited to be with you guys tonight. So this weekend, am I like super, super loud and echoey? You're okay. Hey, crank me down a little bit. Cool. I'll just talk loud and kind of have the mic going. Um, <clears throat> so this weekend, I had to teach for kindergartners la or yesterday afternoon, which is way out of my wheelhouse. Um, very uncomfortable. Um, and then I just taught confirmation for all the sixth graders, and I am glad to be in the room with a bunch of high school students now. I feel way more comfortable. Um, that was a weird statement to say, by the way. I'm glad to be in the room with a bunch of high schoolers. So tonight, I'm going to try to explain all of the New Testament. Um, how many of you were here two weeks ago when I explained all of the Old Testament-ish? Right? And so I, I explained most of the Old Testament, or I would like to say I explained all of it. Um, and tonight I want to connect the two a little bit. I want to teach you about the New Testament and a little bit about its structure and how it came to be. Um, and then I want to encourage you a little bit of why the heck does this matter at all, okay? So we're going to kind of sit in those places a little bit. So Last, or two weeks ago when I was talking about the Old Testament, I built up to a place where, where I said that um, the prophets, right, which is the last section of the Old Testament as we read it, the prophets were writing about who? I, wrote, I did a, a word, it started with an M. A Messiah, right? And Messiah was translated as anointed one or chosen one or Savior, and then we translate that, or they translate into, that into Greek as which word? Uh, Christ. Christ, right? So they say that we are looking for this Christ person. We are looking for this Christ person who's going to come and save us. And so when the Old Testament ends, where we see it, there is this long period of waiting between the last words that we read in the Old Testament and the first word in Matthew. There's a long period of waiting that they're, they're, they're just waiting for what is going to happen next. They are waiting for this Christ person. And the New Testament is the story, right? What are the first four books of the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And so they are the story of this person, the Christ, the Savior that they have. And so <clears throat> I want to look real quick. What is it that's in the New Testament? So we have four Gospels, right? So we have the four Gospels. And then we have Acts. Then we have the letters. And then we have that last crazy book that we call... <laughs> Deuteronomy, yeah. All right, so we have, we have these four different components of the New Testament. The four Gospels, right, which is the story of Jesus, right, the story of the redemption. Acts, which is really just a book of history. It's the story of how the church started. It's a, it's a history book. And then we go to the letters, which is a bunch of communication, right, between Paul and other apostles and other churches, right? Paul is talking to pretty much people like us, people who are in the church, people who are getting started. And then we have this crazy book of Revelation that we can pretty much compare a little bit to the major and minor prophets saying they're, they're doing some, some deeper thought there, right? They're prophesizing about what will happen in the future. So that's the breakdown of this. So we have, first of all, four Gospels, right? So we're going to do it like this. Mark. Then we got, oh, I'm going to do it. Matt. Luke. And I'm going to put John down here because he's real weird. All right. So we have these four books, and there are these four different accounts of the gospel, or uh, of the story of Jesus, right? Jesus' story. And so we look at them and we notice something that um, they're kind of similar in areas. At least these three are. And com it's commonly believed that, that these books kind of came to be um, more than likely between um, C 
60 and 80 years after Christ. I know that's a huge range. Um, 20 years prior to that, more than likely, these were in an early form, which means people started to scratch them down. They came into their solid form about 60 to 80 years after Christ. Okay, but as we look at them being written, how they all came together, there's this crazy thing. There's several theories, and I'm just going to present one to you all to kind of show how these things might have come together. So we're going to add, we're going to make a square here, and I'm just going to call this Q. All right? So if you look at all of these Gospels, we have what are called the three synoptic Gospels. They are three Gospels that are similar to each other. And so here's what we notice, is that Mark definitely shared some stuff with Matthew. And he also shared some stuff with Luke, because we can read that and know that they shared it with one another. But also there's this other crazy source out there that they just call Q. And more than likely, this source shared with Luke and shared with Matthew, but he was like, uh-uh to Mark. Or the time periods were a little bit off. So they shared all this information together, and they have these three Gospels. Now, who does that leave out? John, right? John wanted to write his own type of Gospel. John wanted to write a book of worship. And so he kind of took this whole different approach in how he wrote his Gospel. Gospel? Gospel. Um, and so this is a little bit of the formation of all of these. Now, um, the letters and acts are more than likely written about 15 to 20 years prior to these. So these are kind of some of the earliest writings in working towards the Gospels. All right. So that's a lot of information and a lot of heady stuff, right? We have these Gospels that kind of came together and they shared and they wanted to share the story of Jesus and tell the history of how we began and then uh, they communicated with one another, right? And we learn from all of those things. And so the next question that, that you're probably kind of asking is like, Adam, what the heck does this matter to me, right? And so as I was thinking about that, like how do I answer that question, I was thinking of my really good friend Annie. And so Annie and I were great friends in high school, and uh, we went to two separate colleges, very different areas. I went to Lambeth University to study religion, and she went to uh, DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois, right? Like Jackson, Tennessee, Chicago. Whew. Way different worlds, all right? But I remember months into her being at school there, she would call me and she would, she would have these questions and, and kind of these big Bible questions. And I think she was thinking that like I knew the answers, like I still don't really understand all of this stuff that much. I went to school for a long while and I still don't understand it and I was just in school for a few months at the time and she kept asking me these big questions. And so I was like, Annie, what's, what's going on? And, and Annie kept sharing. She was like, Adam, I'm meeting all these people from different faiths. I'm meeting people from all over the place. And they're telling me about what they believe. And then they're asking me all these questions about the Bible. And I have no idea how to answer them. <clears throat> I have no idea how to answer them. And so a lot of this series is, is helping to prepare you guys a little bit to maybe be able to answer some of these questions. Now this was like a flyby version of the New Testament, okay? But being able to know a little bit about how some of these things were structured, I think is important. Now let's kind of get back to the Christ story. There's this cool thing that happens when you think about the Old Testament, right? That whole story that they're looking for a Messiah and then you read in the New Testament, and, and for me, connecting these two seemingly separate books, I kind of had like a, a click moment one day when I was reading in Luke. And it's in Luke 4, and Jesus comes back to his hometown for one of the first, time, first times since he's been away. And he comes back, and he goes into uh, the synagogue, as was tradition for him, and, and he got called up to read. And so he, he unrolled the scroll, and found the place where it was written. And he reads from the scroll. This, the, the scroll. This, is, this is Old Testament that he's reading. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach the good news to the poor. To procre proclaim release to the prisoners. And recovery of sight to the blind. To, li to liberate the oppressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he kind of did like a mic drop moment. 
and he rolled the scroll back up. And as he's walking off, he said, this has been fulfilled in me today. He's saying, I, that person that you're waiting for that's going to come and release all those captive people, that's going to do crazy things, that's me. I'm him. And it's like a hush falls over the audience. And then he, he starts sharing more about that he's going to go and he's going to share this message with everyone. And they are so upset about the idea that he would not only just say that he is this Christ, but also that he was going to go and share it with everyone, that they run him out of the town. They try to kill him right there. Because that's how important it was that they were looking for this Christ person. And Jesus says, I am that person. So he starts doing that. That's the connection. I, I am that person. That's, that's why the writers of the gospel were so enthralled with this story. It was so important that they share the story of this Christ person coming on earth. So I'm, I'm reading in Acts right now. And there's this really cool um, passage that, that every time I come to it, I'm like, man, that's just so cool. I don't know how. And so Acts, right? The history of, of how we kind of got started. And it's talking about the early apostles, right? The, the early people in the church foundation. And they're going and spreading the word. And, and, and the way, the celebration that they had, the way was spreading and growing. And, and they talked and they said, there's this line that says, um, and we couldn't stop sharing about what we had seen and what we had heard. They just kept sharing it. They said, we can't stop talking about this. We can't stop sharing all of these things that Christ has done and that God's spirit is now doing through us. We can't stop talking about it. They were so passionate about that. They couldn't stop talking about it. And that's the reason that we have the gospels. We have the New Testament now because they kept sharing about it and talking about it and writing it down. And now we have it with ourselves now. So I have this, um, I have this picture um, that I always have on my desk. Or not on my desk, it's just always in my office. It's, <clears throat> it's a picture of my grandfather. And it, it's hard to see it. Y'all can come up and, and see it um, after we get done. But he's sitting um, in the very back of a train. Um, he worked for the railroad forever. Um, and when he retired, he was vice president, but he, he had this office car, they called it. They would attach an office within a, a railroad car to the back of a train, and he would just ride it. And he would watch the tracks, and he, the, the image that this is, is he was sitting in the back in a chair, and he just had a legal pad, and he was taking notes on the tracks. And he loved doing that. That sounds like the most boring thing in the world to me. Like, I'm sitting here watching train tracks and taking notes on them. That sounds so boring. But he was so passionate about it. He loved every moment of it. He had a passion that was just so awesome. And I keep this in my office because I want to remember the passion that he has for trains every day. Because young people, my passion every day is this story. It's the most incredible story that I've, that I've ever written, or that I've ever written, that I've ever read. <laughs> Disclaimer, where's the camera? I did not write the Bible. <laughs> it's the most incredible story I've ever read. And regardless of discrepancies with, with translations and with who might have, have written it, it is still the most interesting and life-giving story I have ever read. And I want to remember the passion that my grandfather had because I, I want to live out that same passion about this story. Just like the apostles, they couldn't stop sharing about what had happened in their lives. That's a lot of this story. Being so passionate about something, you can't stop sharing about it. I think that's one of the, the beauties of the New Testament. So one more thing, and then I'm done. I want, I want to kind of address, it was, um, it was a hard week in the life of high schoolers. Um, there, was, there was two deaths this past week. Um, and in particular, a lot of the ones that hit home for y'all was um, at Brentwood High. 
I, I hope I don't get choked up talking about this, but on Friday, we, we got these messages, and, and Lindsay and I decided to go up to the high school, and we spent some time with you guys, and I, we just want to express that, that we hurt with you. Um, we are hurting, and I know that y'all are hurting. That is, that is a hard thing to go through, um, and to have to know that happened. But I want to share a story that I heard Friday while I was at the school because I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since. We went, we went to kind of one of the back hallways and we sat there and we hung out and we talked and we shared stories and we laughed and we cried and we prayed. And I think those are some of the only things that you can do in some of those moments. But someone shared a story about something that happened in the senior courtyard. And I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since because I, I think it talks about the New Testament. They said that, that all the seniors were in the senior courtyard and they were praying and they were there and they were just sad. And they said that there was silence for a while. And just nobody was talking. And I can imagine what that's like to just sit in silence and to sit in what feels like hopelessness. And someone shared that there was a young girl that started, God, that started singing, Lord, I need you. And that, every time I have thought about that, that, that has brought me to tears. Thinking about, that's the truth, people. That's the story of all this. We need God. Because I can tell you that I, I have no hope if it's not for this great story. And there's a bunch of questions about all of it, but the, the truth in the end is that there is a loving Savior and God loves us regardless of situations. And all I can do at the end of the day is say, I don't, I don't know who wrote it. I don't know all of that stuff. But God, I need you. And because I have that great need, I will pick this book up again and again and learn it as, as best as I can. Because I need that God. And there is hope when it feels like there is no hope in this book. And there is light when it feels like darkness is endless. That's the story of this. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the greatest story ever written. And God, it, it is confusing and there are any number of theories about how it came to be. And God, we could turn circles around all of that. The truth at the end of the day is, God, we need you. Because we can't do this on our own. Every hour, we need you here with us. And this, this story that you gave us promises us that you will be here in all moments. When darkness is around, your light will shine. When it feels like there is no hope, you will provide hope. You will free the captives. You will heal the blind. You will heal the sick. You will be with us in all moments. God, thank you that you are a God that shows up and that you provide such an awesome story for us. God, we say all of this in your Son's name and our Savior's name, Jesus Christ.